Almighty Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our glorious and victorious Savior, Jesus Christ, we humbly ask for your blessing upon our worship of you on this, your holy and sanctified Sabbath day, so that we may grow more in our knowledge of you, our love for you, and our obedience to you. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done, I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, he shall be my son. But the fearful, and the unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Amen. We are now entering a different era of Bible history. The judges are coming to an end with Samuel, the era of the judges. In preparation for now the monarchy, it was sort of off to a rocky start, because Saul, as we'll read, didn't turn out to be a very good choice, and perhaps the reason the Lord let that happen is to show that outward appearance, and that was emphasized actually with David, Saul was very physically impressive, but he was not a good leader, and he made some very glaring, very foolish mistakes. So he was rejected as the king. David was sort of similar in a way in that he made mistakes too at times. But he repented. He was a man of a different heart than Saul. Saul was a carnal man. Whereas David, although he was carnal in a lot of ways on the battlefield or with women, he was nevertheless a man after God's own heart, meaning that he had the Holy Spirit. And he was able to accomplish things for the purpose of the coming of the Messiah. It wasn't about David. It wasn't about any of those kings. Thank God for that, because if it was, my wouldn't they, wouldn't we be in a lot of trouble because of the mess they made of things? But it was a, a groundwork laying forth for a king that is coming who's not going to mess things up, who's going to be perfect. He's going to do what the kings of Israel only really did as a matter of prophecy, the same as the, for example, the high priest, the Levite high priest. They were carnal men. They had failings. Whereas the ultimate high priest, he's perfect. He does everything perfectly. Many people make uh, a, a big issue over the blood sacrifices, of all those animal sacrifices, apart from the lamb, and they assume it's the same thing. But the animal sacrifices that the high priest did, apart from the lamb, were for his own symbolic, and that's all it was, symbolic cleansing from sin in order that he would be ceremonially sinless, to make the Day of Atonement, the Atonement Sacrifice, to bring the Passover lamb, and you'll notice that it's spread over the two seasons, spring and autumn holy days. Passover occurs in the spring. The Day of Atonement turns, occurs in the fall, but it's really talking about the same thing, the sacrifice and the delivery of it. And Christ didn't have to do that. He was sinless already. So that part of it, of that sacrifice, the lamb was the only part that applied to him. And a lot of people mistake that, meaning they think that the lamb was done away or the sacrifice. And, you know, if you don't 
really adhere to what was being taught, then it is sort of done away, or at least it doesn't apply. And so much of Christianity, people will look at that and all works. You, know, you, you teach works. Well, yes, I do. It's true, I do. I teach obedience to the Lord. Because that's what the Bible teaches. And we're here reading the Word of God, so that's what it says. So that's what we teach. Because really all we're doing is voicing what's already there. We're not looking to teach our own stuff, because it won't get you anywhere, as the churches of this world are going to learn. And not necessarily the hard way, because we were in the churches of this world, weren't we? I was in the, the Catholic Church of Rome church, until I one day, by whatever means it was, began to realize things. I think what really did it is I got my first Bible, started reading it. And that's a unique for a Catholic, because Catholics, they may own them, but there are Catholics who read the Bible, but they don't really look to it as the authority. They have the Pope. I went to a Catholic school, we never read the Bible. We had Mass every Friday. We never read the Bible. For some reason, I can still remember this, a long time ago. I went to the library, school library one day, just to see if they had a Bible, and, and I found two, two of them. But they were like brand new condition. You could tell they were never used. And they weren't brand new condition because they were brand new. They were there for a while. You could tell that. But they were, nobody ever read them. Whereas, you know, here, Bibles to me, I wear the poor things out. I've got, I, I don't know what to do with Bibles that are wore out. I can't just throw them away and I can't burn them and I can't just throw them in the trash. I just don't know what to do with them. I never figured that out. So I have them all. I, I have every Bible I've ever owned. And if you look at the shelf where they are, I have most of them together, the covers are, are worn off, the pages are all wrinkled, and you know it's not because I abused the poor thing, but I worked that Bible. I read it. I really did read it. And you know, if you're handling them here, I'm reading actually, a, this is a paper Bible. I had to change computers for the recording. I began actually the sermons with a computer Bible, but I, I use like a paper Bible now. And the time will come when it's going to be wore out. Wear the things out. Because you read them. That's what it's there for. And in order to do that, to understand what we need to understand, we can't just say, sort of sit there and say, well, I've got a good heart. I mean well. And the Lord has got grace. He's going to save me. Some actually think they're saved now. So doing any, doing anything at all. And that's just not true. It's not. You have to obey the Lord. Christ died for repentant sinners. Otherwise, why do you suppose there's a lake of fire? Coming. For those who, who won't. And you know, they, you look at... There, there's a thing with the Mayan uh, end of the world thing. Well, that didn't work. That didn't happen. And we knew that, didn't we? Because we read the Bible right here. We read this book. We know, I can. I don't know when the return of Christ is going to happen. The Bible doesn't tell us that. But I know it's not. I can say with biblical authority, based on what the Bible says, that the return of Jesus Christ is at least 42 months away from right now as we're recording this sermon. Because, number one, the two witnesses haven't appeared yet with power. There's a lot of people running around thinking they're, they're the two witnesses or something, but they're not. They're just deluded people. They want to be a hero or a star or something, but, you know, if you read what the two witnesses are going to go through, they're not going to, I'm sure they're not going to feel like heroes. They're going to have the world hate them. Hate them. I mean, hate them to the point where that when they're eventually killed, the world's going to celebrate and leave their bodies in the, in, the, in the street. Won't even give them a burial. And that, what, which is, just, I find surprising because, or not, because they're going to be heavily outnumbered, but that someone of the church doesn't bury them at that time, rather than leaving the, body, the bodies up there. I mean, I would if I had the opportunity to bury them. I, I'd get them. 
Even if I had to fight my way sort of there to get him, I, I, I would try. But it, it, it's, it's obvious from what's written there that that's not going to happen. And perhaps they're being left there again so that the world can see the resurrection. And the world is then going to realize that they were preaching the truth. But their ministry is going to go on 42 months, and it hasn't begun yet. So we know that. We know the world's not going to end. It's not going to end in the way the Mayans believed anyway. It's going to end in the sense that Satan's rule over it is going to end. This corrupt, evil world that we live in right now, full of violence and deception, is going to end. The tragedy there in uh, Connecticut last week, the shooting of children in a school, and it was bound to ca happen. I actually put a, a link on for on it our on our Facebook page. The perpetrator of that crime was mentally ill, or possessed by the devil, because there was an article actually on in which he used to worship the devil. He had a, he had a, some sort of online page that worshipped the devil. So he may have been mentally ill. Or he may have simply been demon possessed. Either way, I, I think that what he did there to say that was caused solely by mental illness, I think, is a disservice to people who have mental illness. Because there are a lot of people who are mentally ill who would never do that. Something like that. But Satan, he would do it. Rather, he would inspirit someone to do it and to walk in and kill. Little children, that, that's about as low as it gets. Really. And ultimately, you ever notice that how those things happen, people who do that, they almost always commit suicide at the end? You ever wonder why that is? But it's a tragedy. Those, those little children, you know, that has happened to all of us, hardly the only one. But those little children are going to live again. And that's a good thing. And the horrible death that they suffered, but they're going to live again. They're going to be resurrected in, in time, in their due time. And they're going to live in a world then. They're going to grow up in a peaceful world. There are going to be people running around, running around shooting people for any reason. And they're going to learn the truth and have the opportunity to obey it. Yeah, said Tom. Put the link on for empty cemeteries. That's where those children are headed right now. They're in the graves right now, sleeping. But from their perspective, it will be... We cannot imagine what went on in that classroom, the screaming as that shooting was going on. That was their last conscious awareness. But like the blink of an eye... From their perspective, there they are awake again in the kingdom of God, surrounded by loving people of God, with Christ on this earth, having put down all violence, the swords into plowshares will all be there, and those little ones are going to live. So that we can take comfort in. And not just them. Children, I mean, in, how many have been killed in wars? How many have been killed by abortion? Now, they were supposedly in a safe place too, but and they're all going to live. Because from God's perspective, people, life begins at conception. And humans can't, can't kill forever. They can only kill for a while. So, we can take comfort in that knowledge. And that Satan, well, he's going to get put away in his tongue. But it's going to be a horrendous time until then. Much has been said about the safe place. Where is our safe place? Should we run to the hills? Or build a bunker or get a whole bunch of guns? Well, some people think that's safe, but how often has that been tried? And the people within the compound end up turning on each other. It's not a safe place either. Safe places in the truth. Because, as the Bible says as well, you try to save your life for the sake of this life, you're going to lose it. 
as an eternal life. Because this life, it doesn't matter how safe you are, you're going to get sick, you're going to get injured, you're going to get old and die, one way or the other, even if you make it to 100, or 120, that's the maximum available to us, you're still going to die. There's nothing going to save you from that. If you've used your time frittering it away on things that are only of this life, well, then when you die, you're really going to die. If you've known better, you have to live the truth. That's the safe place. And that's why we're reading this book. Because it tells us all about it. Not that we can do it perfectly. We can't. But we can give it our best effort. And when we mess up, we repent. And when we mess up again, we repent again. Because also, as it happens in this world, the harder you try, the more Satan is going to target you. He's not going to mess with those who are looking so good for this world. You can leave them alone. If you try living by this book, he's going to come at you from every direction. You will not be left with a second's peace in this world. Not as a matter of this world's kind of peace, but you can be completely at peace in the knowledge that it's going to be alright in due time. First Samuel chapter 7, continuing today as we left off last time, the house of Eli had fallen, not necessarily because Eli was corrupt, but he was weak. He would not enforce what he had to be doing. And he's sort of an extreme, in a, a sort of a two-pronged extreme in that way, in that he was weak. But being strong, you have to be strong in the right way. Strong as in obeying the Lord, not making yourself a little kingdom. And again, as the fall of Saul, as we'll get to, was that sort of extreme. There are variations, all sorts of them. But the theme that's in there of obedience or disobedience is a matter of obeying the Lord. Doing what He says. Even if you're not doing it as a matter of the correct motives, it can still be wrong. Just going through the, the motions, so to speak. Uh, the works thing. Many people look at what the Pharisees were doing and they regard that as obedience to the Lord. They say, that's works. Dead works. Well, it is dead works because they'd made it as such. They'd made a religion for themselves. And that was dead works. But the, the holy days of the Lord, the Sabbath of the Lord, they're not dead works. People are going to be obeying them in the, in the kingdom of God. We know that because those who don't won't be in the kingdom of God. It's very plainly stated. But I've gone to that study. The two of them go together. The Lord is not granting grace and salvation to a bunch of rebels. If you have a rebel heart against the king, who is going to rule his kingdom on earth, then you're not going to be there. Your place will be the lake of fire. It's that simple. The Bible is very plain on that statement and that reality. But you have to be, in order to get there, particularly those in the service of the Lord, serving the people. Serving those who were there, are there, being served as a matter of what the Lord wants them to do. And Eli apparently was not doing that. Well, he himself lived a nice, obedient life, but he did it in a, in a shell. He hid his light. And he's, again, another example of letting your light shine, don't put it under a basket, because not only are you hiding your light, you're extinguishing your light. It will go out from lack of oxygen, assuming it's not going to burn the basket. But that in itself is not an entirely inappropriate addition to the analogy, because people who don't do it are headed for the lake far. As we said, you see, it all goes together. But continuing, we saw the fall of the house of Eli, Eli... His two sons carried the Ark of the Covenant out into battle, while blatantly disregarding the Lord in doing so. They were killed in battle. When Eli heard of it, he fell. He was an old man at that time. He fell and was killed from the fall. The entire family was wiped out as a matter of their service to the Lord. It left Samuel, who was really not in a position to carry that on. So what was going to be the solution? Well, Chapter 7, And the men of Kyrgyz, Arim, came and fetched up the ark of the Lord 
and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill, and sanctified Eleazar's son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass, while the ark abode in Kareth jerim that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Now how many people have idols today? of one sort or another. The very famous uh, Academy Awards, and there's other versions of it all around the world, various stars will have their awards once you understand them, this little idol in their hands. What is the difference between that and someone with a Mary statue, or some little Buddha, or some little, all the religions that have, what's the difference? Is there a difference? When people say that movie star is my idol, is there a difference? Or any some object that people may have walking around. Our electronic devices today sometimes, like little handheld idols, people can't live without them. They look to them. They live their lives through them. And they become used in a bad way. I'm not saying they don't have a legitimate purpose. Modern day communications, modern day even reading the Bible. But if they become your life in a way other than that, they become an idol. And anything. The Bible can even become an idol. Strange as that may seem, but it can. If you regard one particular version as the truth, and all other versions, well, they're satanic. But they're all translations. None of them is perfect. The King James is, is, a, is a magnificent old translation. And I use it for, for daily Bible study primarily because it has no copyright. But it is not perfect. It has its problems, and when you're aware of them, they're not a problem. But if you are not willing to even look at that reality, then it becomes an idol. You're blinding yourself to truth, and that's idolatry. Particularly, you know, and Satan just loves that one. You know, he perverts it. You know, the temptation of Christ, what did he do? He was standing there quoting scripture to the Son of God. Satan was. He does it all every day, all around the world, to people all around the world. Verse 4, Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said, There, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. And to interject there, judge, he was a judge. It's a unique combination of things in that how Moses had died, Joshua had died, the era of the judges had continued for two or three centuries. There was sort of a shift then to looking to Eli, who failed in his effort, if you want to call it that, to do what he was told to do. And then now we're seeing a transition. It wasn't sort of a disaster on the part of the Lord allowing a disaster to happen, but you could see it was a preparation for the king because as with Christ himself, he made his sacrifice. He's awaiting now his return as king. There's first the high priesthood which qualifies the king to be the king. We'll put the link on for what happened after Christ arrived in, arrived in heaven. He's going to return in due time according to the date in time that the Father only has determined, even Christ doesn't decide it, or doesn't have that authority. And he's coming back to rule the earth in preparation for the Father's coming. But all those things, you know, people look at the kingdom, does, is the word kingdom, is that religious? Well, it can be if there's a state religion, can't it? Most kingdoms or countries have a de facto, if not in fact, state religion. And the kingdom of God is going to have a state religion in itself. But it's not going to be religion in, in the sense of today, well, uh, what church do you go to? Or what what faith do you have? Or everybody has a different road to the same place. By the time pe that the arrival of Christ, that one is going to be very plainly where the destination of many different roads to the same place are. As in hellfire. Because people are going to have to follow the one and only way to God. And that is to Christ. And looking to Christ, looking to Zion, 
all of those things. There's no compromise in that. You can't compromise something that is not compromisable, as in having anyone having the, the ability, the authority, the right to compromise it. It isn't our property. It's God's truth. And we are there to accept it and obey it and do according to what it says in order to get to the point where we can live in that kingdom. As we read in our opening prayer, you know, it's a very stark contrast between who's going to make it and who isn't. But it's a choice. There aren't going to be any innocent people in the lake of fire. And there aren't going to be any guilty people in the kingdom of God. But it's doable as human because, you know, we're all human. We do our best. Verse 7, And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel, and when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, and he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. Now there's Samuel doing what in effect was the job of the high priest, but that had been uprooted because it was not he was not serving what he was to be doing. Verse 10, And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel, but the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them till they came unto beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen and called the name of it Eben Ezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they came no more into the coast of Israel, and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. And the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron even unto Gath, and the coast thereof did Israel deliver out of the hands of the Philistines. And there was a peace between Israel and the Amorites. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah and judged Israel in all those places. And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house, and there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. So again, it's an interesting combination of judge and, in effect, in effect high priest, although the tabernacle was not there, the ark was not there. It, it's going to be now, uh, the tabernacle as it had been used is now sort of going to be put aside because with the coming of David it will be brought to Jerusalem, still in a tent because that's the way the Lord commanded it. Uh, again, as a matter of putting aside our tent, our tabernacle, put on the link for that study. But even the, the temple, as the people of Judah understood, can be put aside too uh, if its time is used up as a matter of becoming corrupt. You know, the temple is not there today, is it? And the later temple is not there either when it became something that was simply not what it was originally built to do. So it can be put aside as well. 1 Samuel chapter 8, And it came to pass when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes and perverted judgment. And to inject the same old story. And it wasn't because Samuel was weak. It's because these boys were bad. And he understood as well, Samuel understood that you can't ram your religion down an adult's throat, when someone grows up, they're responsible for themselves. You can't hold their hand anymore. You can't teach them anymore if they're not willing to learn. And they have their choice because their judgment, once you're an adult, well, you're responsible for yourself in that way. But it's sort of a shocker, really, in that way, in that way, in that, that they didn't follow the Lord. But again, character isn't inherited, neither is it. You can look at that. There can be someone who's had a bad father and they can turn out very good, or they can. Someone ha can have a good father and the children turn out not so good. Sometimes it's by influence, whatever, it happens. But it, it happens. The world is full of examples of that. 
Verse 4, Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Thou makest a king to judge us like all the nations. So stop there. Whose idea was the king? And would it have happened anyway? Do you think? As a matter of what was coming, because again, the king, it just means the head of a kin, the head of a family. And the kingdom of God is exactly that. The children of God being born again, the principles as we explained, it's very biblical in that way. And you know, even the word patriotism comes from the word father, faithful to the father. And certainly we have our patriotism in that way as well, don't we? It's the one we that means the most to us because it's the one that's going to be eternal. It's an eternal patriotism, whereas, you know, in this country you're you're here or you're there, you happen to be born in this country, you happen to be born in that country. Or you move to a country, become a citizen there, and that's your patriotism for this life. But in the end, everybody ends up in the same place, don't they? As a matter of the end of a physical life. Whether you're young or old, or whether you die of an illness or an injury, or uh, old age, whatever. Whenever it happens, the result is exactly the same. There's no difference. And as a matter of the time, you know, compared a human lifetime to forever, you know, someone who lives 20 years isn't really living a whole lot much less than someone who lives 120. When it comes, you, and you compare that to forever. And the Lord, if you have enough time, and people, as he said to his children, and all the children that have died in wars or died in all sorts of ways, they're all going to get their opportunity again. That's very plainly stated in the Bible. Put the link on for that. But continuing, verse 6, But the thing displeased Samuel, and when they said, Give us a king to judge us, and Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And again, the character there, you know, when the people, there was Samuel already in the driver's seat, and the people came and said, Well, I want to make a king. You know, there he was. He was getting old. It was getting toward the end of his time, but he could have at least made himself king at that point, and then commanded them to do whatever they wanted. That would have been the typical human nature. Someone who lusts to be the leader. We see it in, even in, in the Church of God, people seeking to be the, the leading minister, whatever that's supposed to be. And there's almost nothing that they won't do to their own brothers and sisters in order to fulfill that lust. There are a lot of, actually, a lot of, as, we, as we've learned the hard way, there are a lot of predators in the true Church of God as a matter of wanting someone wanting to be the leading minister. We've learned our hard lessons about that. It's actually the reason I don't have links to other ministries on our pages anymore, as I did at first. But suddenly, you know, we, we did that very generously, I think, considering they don't do it for us, or wouldn't do it for us, not that I was doing it anyway. But very soon you become uh, secondary and then almost irrelevant in your own ministry because some lusting preacher wants to be the so-called leader when he should be serving Christ. The, the Diotrephes example uh, wasn't just back in the Bible. I'll put the link on for him. How he became a, a predator within the Church of God, just sort of absconded with people who did not belong to him, but he regarded them as his little flock, when the fact is they were Christ's little flock. And when, you know, the Apostle John was even put out by him or refuted, refused by him. I mean, imagine that. That takes a, a pretty high amount of gall to imagine somebody putting out the Apostle John. The one, the apostle that Christ loved, the one that the Messiah gave him to care for his mother after his death, I imagine that. But Diotrephes, he was a man of lust. He was looking to be the leading minister, and it's it's the same old story. It's tragic. It's the same old story, though. The Church of God is, is has been in this under attack. I, I understand the reason for it. Satan is not going to bother with the Catholics and all the nice Baptists and all the nice Protestants out there. He's going to leave them alone. He's going to shine them up just as nice and pretty. Whereas the Church of God, he's going to do the dirty on us as quick as he can, very as often as he can. And, you know, he uses people within the church. How else could he do it? I mean, it makes complete sense, but the the result is, is not nice at all. And we just have to learn from it and get stronger because of it. Uh, we had, our, as our, you may recall, we had our example with the, the Sabbath group. That we had hidden members, people playing, uh, actually hacking, people from the Church of God actually hacking the Sabbath group. 
I mean, really, that to me was that was an eye-opening experience. I must admit, I never, I wouldn't have saw that one coming, but I do now. Not naive about that anymore, because you know you either serve Christ or you're not. If you're serving yourself, and you use people who are looking to be Christian, and if you have biblical truth, then there's the hook. But you know, it it doesn't mean it's like Satan. He's taking like he did to Eve, how he took the truth and just twisted it just enough, made her under, made her think that she misunderstood. We'll put the link on for the study done just recently. Now Adam and Eve actually sinned differently. Eve was deceived. Adam wasn't. Eve thought she was doing the right thing. The devil just sort of sort of got her to think that she misunderstood the original command. But Adam, he was standing right there, and he said nothing. He didn't correct the situation. He didn't rebuke the devil. He didn't say to Eve, no, that's not right. He watched her take the forbidden fruit, and he took of it himself. He knew exactly what he was doing, whereas Eve didn't. And why Adam just did that is amazing to me. But why a lot of people do a lot of things are amazing to me, too. And I'm, I'm talking about within the Church of God. What the world does out there, well... There's nothing we can do about that. But within the church, a lot of cases, boy, look out. Because, you know, Christ is the leading minister. He's serving God, and we're, we're here to serve Him. We're not here to lord it over everybody. And the, and the Lord actually commanded people, don't do that. That's what the Gentiles do, as in non-followers of the Christ. Because even Israel is in itself a picture of the kingdom of God, and of the church of God that will get you there. Because as we know very well, you know, anybody can be in the kingdom of God. That's spiritual Israel, just as they could have been. As we've covered in previous sermons, you know, anybody could be in Israel. Whether it be Rahab from Jericho or, or Ruth, as we read, who became a key ancestor of King David. They weren't Israelite. Or Ephraim and Manasseh, born of a, an Egyptian mother. I think they could be a, could have been easily told apart from their brothers who were born up in Syria. They would have all the one the ones born in Syria would have had the typical Middle Eastern appearance, but the two born in Egypt of an Egyptian mother. By the way, the Egyptians of that ancient time, just as they are today, were black people. Egypt's in Africa, so you know they probably could be told apart from their brothers. Whether that evened out over time, as some people desperately want to believe, so they all, by the time of Christ, they were all white, blue eyed Europeans. And that's a little silly, isn't it? But people sort of believe that. And I'm not picking on blue eyed Northern Europeans. I am one myself. I, I'm German through my, my father's side, and, and Dutch Belgian on my mother's side, so, you know. I can look at those uh, Jesus pictures and understand a lot of those artists were German or Dutch uh, and why they believed what they did. But the fact is they should have been painted, painting Middle Eastern people. And Middle Eastern people were not Northern Europeans. They just aren't. And to this day they're not. But it doesn't matter as a matter of what they did. Nothing can save you. You can have whatever appearance you have, and you can make it or you can not make it, according to what you want to do about it. Verse 7, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Stop. Notice that. Reign over them. And even the term foreign, it's like for rain as in far rain, someone from a from afar is reigning over you. That's the word, the word foreign means it means foreign king reigning over you. And how that term just keeps coming back and around and around as well. The nations that are created by man are mostly a matter of nations created by man, as in the species, human, autumn. But continuing. What's going to happen now? Verse 8, According to all the works which they have done since the day I brought them out of Egypt, and even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, 
howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked him of the king, and they said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. Don't stop there. He's going to draft your sons and send them off to war. Verse 12, And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties, and set them to ear his ground, and reap his harvest, and make his instruments of war, and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries, and to be cooks, and to be bakers. And he will take your fields, and your vineyards, and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed, and of your vineyards, and give them, and give to his officers, and to his servants. And he will take your men servants, and your maid servants, and your goodliest young men, and your asses, and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep, and ye shall be his servants. And he shall cry out in that day, because of your king, which ye shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Now stop there, they just had the warning. No, the king isn't going to fight your battles. You are, and your children are. He's going to drop them all. He's going to mobilize the entire economy, make it a war economy for this man's ego, so he can be the leading nation. Verse 21, And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go, ye every man unto his city. So they had their warning, but they wanted the ways of the world. They were very carnal people, standing there with the little hand idols, one sort or another. Ignored, they turned their back on the Lord and said, We want a king of our of ourselves. Now what's the wrong, what's the problem with that? First of all, is it a legitimacy as a king? Because the king is the father of a people. Just as the Lord was the father of the people who created who he created very beginning, but as a nation he created Israel, didn't he? He's the one that renamed Jacob as Israel. He is the founding father of Israel. And we'll put the link on for who the Lord God is, and it's Christ. Christ is the founding father of Israel. So they rejected him as king, as we just read, in order to get a king of their own, but he, by definition of king, he's not a king. Not really. He may use, the term is used in that way, and certainly dynasties began. The king of David, David's line, that certainly continued right to Christ, again, when it was recovered from the ones that they had taken it from. It was recovered, wasn't it? They rejected the king in order to create this now, as we're reading. Saul didn't work out, but David was there, and it continued on. But what was the re result? What's going to be the result in the kingdom of God? We'll put the link on for the kingdom of the Lord God. He's merely reestablishing or re retaking what he himself created and which the people absconded with here as we read in the time of Samuel. Was David necessary, you may ask then? Well, the Lord was already the king as a matter of Israel. Putting humans on that throne to manage the nation. We can see the purpose of that. But the Lord didn't somehow become king as a matter of later, at some later point, because he was Israel king. As we said, the founding father. He's the one that changed Jacob's name to Israel. There was no Israel before that time. So he was already the king. So that part, as a matter of fulfillment, could, have, could it have continued on? For example, can be the next question. With just the high priest. Well, it did in the time of Eli. 
there was no Joshua then. There were the the judges, these tribal warlords, but there was no national king. So you can see there how it functioned in that way. In the service of the Lord, the Passover had already been attended to, so that part was done. The coming of the Christ, it didn't need this, because by the time he did come, they had so befuddled what they'd been originally given that they weren't obeying it anyway. They rejected it. Were they necessary? Well, only in the sense that they were the ones that killed him. They sacrificed the Lamb of God. He was rejected by the high priest. The high priest was directly involved in his sacrifice, just he was supposed, as he was supposed to be. But he did it out of maliciousness, not out of a sense of obedience to the Lord. But you can see there the purpose was never shaken. It was never moved from the course that Christ set it upon until such times like a train in which the tracks are laid down, but inside the train there's a riot going on. That's really what it came down to. And the riot is Israel. The people, as we read. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't end. It goes on from the time of, look at all the things that happened to David, as we will, and we'll get to. But his own family, how that continued on, and the division, and all the idolatry and the slaughter that continued on from the, the shenanigans of that monarchy. But it didn't matter what the people were doing. That's the point. People will look at that. The reason I explain that. People will look at that and they'll try to lay that on to Christ. As though, well, it's all full of flaws and everything. But no. Christ was already there. He was already the king. Do you really think that he surrendered his ultimate royal authority to any man? Because, you know, if he's done it, then what is he? what authority does he have now, for example? Or when he returns, is he going to need anyone's permission when he returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as we read in the book of Revelation? No. He's going to rule with a rod of iron. Many people interpret that in a number of ways. It's exactly what that rod of iron is. Considering it will be the Iron Kingdom of Rome that is going to be smashed at that time. He's going to deal with the world on its own terms. But you can look there, there... People will look at something that has been messed up by humans and try to blame that on Christ or see flaws in that. I hear oftentimes from the B.C. and A.D. calendar system, which was invented by a Roman monk centuries after the birth of Christ, and they will say, well, there's a Bible mistake there of Christ, because they know now from the death of Herod that Christ was born in 4 or 5 or maybe even earlier, 6 or 7, B.C., and they say, well, how can Christ be born before Christ? And they'll they'll try to blame that on the Bible or question the birth of Christ, when in fact there was no B.C. and A.D. At that time, it was, even, it was invented by a Church of Rome monk centuries after Christ, and even then as a matter of trying to put together an Easter calendar which denies the Passover, which denies Christ. Easter denies Christ. It doesn't observe it. Passover recognizes Christ, celebrates Christ, but the rest of it doesn't. When Samuel chapter 9, see where this is going, don't you? It, it's, it's like a matter of human nature just sort of channeling itself and the Lord having made his own purpose manifest within it, how something can be perfect but is accomplished through Humans, you know, which is amazing. 1 Samuel chapter 9, there was a man of Benjamin, whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bechorath, the son of Aph, yeah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. Now, to interject there, what if Saul had not turned out to be a bad leader? What if he had been successful? Does that mean, therefore, that the Messiah would have been, rather than descended from King David of Judah, that he would be descended of King Saul of Benjamin? Apart from the fact that Benjamin remained within the kingdom of Judah and of Judaism, the religion that became Judaism, later on, but no one could have foresaw that. No human could have, anyway. Could that have been? And the answer is no. 
because we know going right back to the book of Genesis how Jacob knew that the Messiah was going to come through Judah. So one way or another that was going to happen. That prophecy could not be broken. And it was already determined not by Jacob who the Lord renamed as Israel. As we said, the king there had already chosen his ancestors from whom he would be born as a human while he was still yet the Lord God. And when he returned after his human experience, is again today the Lord God, still that king. So if you look at that that way, how that was sort of not going to work no matter what, but again as an experience of just why that is, consider Verse 2, And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man, and a goodly, and there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he, from his shoulders and upward. He was higher than any of the people. I'll stop there. He was physically impressive. And there's nothing wrong with that. That can be very helpful in this violent world. It can keep you safe. But the thing is, it doesn't necessarily make you a good leader, even though you may be more likely to be chosen as a leader or become a leader, depending on what your definition of leader is. If you're a leader by, in the example of Christ, or if you're a leader in the example of human, humans, most of whom lead from behind at the point of a gun or point of a bayonet or point of a bomb, that's human leadership, force, and again, we can read the Bible and see that it's there. Again, Diotrephes is just one example. What happened to the Galatians? Same thing. It's hardly new. What happened to a lot of the people who, even the motives of, of somebody like Judas, he may have been just decided that, well, maybe he wanted to be the leader. And the Messiah, while well, he wasn't being, because they did view it as a king. Peter did, right to the very end. Did he believed that Jesus of Nazareth was going to lead a rebellion against the Romans, as later happened in terms of zealots. I was in that same era. And when the Messiah gave up, in Peter's eyes, Peter got all confused. It's understandable. You know, when they went to grab Jesus that night, Peter drew a sword and started swinging to defend the king. And in a worldly way, that was the right thing to do. But when the Messiah told him, no, no, Put down your sword. Put up your sword. Let's just surrender. He didn't say that. He didn't say surrender. It's not recorded, but he, he did. In order to be taken as the Lamb of God. And that's just unworldly of this world, isn't it? And people can't quite live by that example. To make yourself a leader in the sense of, of being a servant. You know, the word minister means servant. That's all it means. But continue. Verse 3, And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul, the son, Take now one of the servants with thee, and arise and go seek the asses. And he passed through Mount Ephraim, passed through the land of Shalisha, but they found them not. And they passed through the land of Selim, and there they were not. And he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they found them not. And when they were come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come, and let us return, lest my father leave caring for the asses, and take thought for us. And he said unto him, Behold, now there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he saith come surely to pass. Now let us go thither, peradventure, he can shew us our way that we should go. And then Saul said to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? And to interject there, what man of God do you think they're headed for? Well, we'll get to that. You know the answer, though, don't you? But continue. Verse 8, And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver that will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. 
Before time in Israel, when a man went to choir of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer, for he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Then said Saul to his servant, Well said, Come, let us go. So they went unto the city where the man of God was, and as they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water, and said unto them, Is the seer here? And they answered them, and said, He is, behold, he is before you. Make haste now, for he came today to the city, for he there is a sacrifice of the people today in the high place. As soon as ye be come into the city, ye shall straightway find him, before he go up to the high place to eat, for the people will not eat until he come, because he doth bless the sacrifice, and afterwards they eat that be bidden. Now therefore get you up, for about this time ye shall find him. And they went up into the city, and when they were come into the city, behold, Samuel came out against them for to go up to the high place. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his, in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people because their cry has come unto me. Stop. That sounds very much like a judge, doesn't it? And we're still in the era of the judges. Samuel was a judge. But it's what it sounds like when they, they, they disobeyed the Lord, primarily through idolatry. The Lord permitted or empowered their enemies to teach them a lesson. They then cried out to the Lord, and the Lord gave them a deliverer, or delivered to them a deliverer, and this is what this is sounding like. Saul was another judge. As Samuel was. Verse 17, and when, and when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold, the man whom I spake to thee of, the same shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate, and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is. And Samuel answered Saul, and said, I am the seer. Go up before me unto the high place, where you shall eat with me today and tomorrow. I will let thee go, and will tell thee all that is in thine heart. So notice there as well, Samuel was not making a great show of his responsibility. He was unrecognized. He was walking along, and Saul did not recognize Saul Samuel by anything in his clothing, anything in his purpose. He wasn't surrounded by a, a bunch of people, a bunch of bodyguards. He wasn't surrounded by all sorts of things that were unnecessary to the, his task. Just as Christ wasn't later on, was he? The reason Judas had to point him out to the, to the mob is because he couldn't be told apart from Peter or John the others. Verse 20, And as were thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are found on whom it is, and on whom is all the desire of Israel. Is it not on thee, and on all thy father's house? And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my father the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? And Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the parlor and made them sit in the chiefest place among them that were bidden, which were about thirty persons. And Samuel said unto the cook, Bring the portion which I gave thee, of which I said unto thee, Set it by thee. And the cook took up the shoulder, that which was upon it, and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, Behold, that which is left, set it before thee, and eat, for unto this time hath it been kept for thee, since I said, I have invited the people. So Saul did eat with Samuel that day, and when they were come down from the high place into the city, Samuel communed with Saul upon the top of the house, and they rose early, and it came to pass about the spring of the day that Samuel called Saul to the top of the house, saying, Up, that I may send thee away, 
And Saul arose, and they went out, both of them, he and Samuel, abroad. And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us, and he passed on, but stand thou up still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. Now stop. Saul's getting a really good start there, isn't he? He's humble. He's not messing up. He's willing to listen. He's willing to learn. Samuel is teaching him. Notice there where he said, I will show thee the word of God. I'll put on the link for what does word of God mean, because that means Christ, and how he is the deliverer of that word, and how he delivered unto his servants in order for them to serve him, in order for him to serve the purpose of the coming of the Father. But Saul was off to a good start. I mean, right now, if we didn't know what was to come, or what was going to come, or how, as it, how it turned out, it would look pretty good right now, wouldn't it? He's not messing up. He's humble. He's physically powerful at a time when they needed a deliverer from, from the Philistines. David ended up doing the same thing. He was a deliverer in the same sort of way. Goliath and so on. Unfortunately, he had to do all that at the time of a civil war with Saul, as it turned out. But you notice there, he's off to a good start. He had every advantage. He gave everything. The only thing he was yet missing in large measure was the Holy Spirit, and he was about to get that. So, watch carefully just where he messes it up and how that warning is there for us. Because neither of them, if you were walking along there and you would have saw Samuel and Saul, they would have been noticeable because Saul was apparently a very tall man. Whatever that meant, relatively speaking, in that time, it could have only meant um, six foot tall. If most people back then were like five, six, and five, four, and so on, as apparently they were, that could have been like a head taller, whereas today somebody six, six or more would be required to fit that particular definition in some parts of the world, in other parts of the world it isn't. But he was really there. I mean, he was just into what he needed to be doing. He was humble. They weren't putting on a big show. They weren't saying, this is now our regime. We're, we're, we're running things now. It was nothing at all like that. It wasn't the typical manner that you see today, even in the Church of God, or moreover in the Church of God. It's the last place you should see it, but it's there. And of course, we can read that. It's not something new to our time. They were even doing it at that time. They were looking at who was going to be the leading minister, trying to get Christ to appoint one of them or other sitting at his right hand and doing things that typical human nature. And he rebuked them for it. So, there we are. And it, it's a beautiful start for Saul. But what happens to him? What's he going to do about it now? When Samuel chapter 10, Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? Stop. That says it all, doesn't it? The Lord wasn't giving anything up. It was his inheritance as a matter of his people, his creation, his country, his kingdom. But Saul was to be a captain over it, as in an administrator, commander. Verse 2, When thou art departed from me today, then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulcher in the border of Benjamin, at Zelzah, and they will say unto thee, The asses which thou wentest to seek are found, and lo, thy father hath left the care of the asses, and soareth for you, saying, What shall I do for you, my son? Then shalt thou go on forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor, and there shalt meet these three men, going up to God to Bethel, or Bethel, one carrying three kids, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a bottle of wine. And they will salute thee, and give thee two loaves of bread, which thou shalt receive of their hands. After that thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines, and it shall come to pass, when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets, coming down from the high place with a psaltery, and a tabret, and a pipe, and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. 
And let it be when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. Stop. That is the Holy Spirit. That was the final touch, the final empowerment of what Saul was then capable of doing. But free choice was still there. Character was still there. Ability was still there. And again, the, the lesson of how you can have all of these things going for you, including a very, very great measure of the Holy Spirit, and still have the result that Saul did. There's something else. It isn't just all handed to you and you sort of become some sort of a holy zombie. There's still a matter of thinking, choosing, making the right decisions as a matter of conscious righteousness, choice, living it, not getting carried away by something that seems so grand, but which was given as a means, as an empowerment to serve the Lord. Verse 8, And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices, peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. And when they came thither, to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it came to pass, when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, What is this that has come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And one of the same place answered and said, But who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, is Saul also among the prophets? Stop. He really had everything there, didn't he? He really had it all right there. He had the physical impressiveness. He had the vote of the people, if you will. He had the blessing of the prophet Samuel, the backing of the prophet Samuel. Therefore, the priesthood was on his side. And the, finally, at the end, the final approval, the final anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's everything. What more could he need other than then the character to use it properly? Verse 13. Because a lot of people, they look at Saul as though, well, he was just this, this brute who came along and just clumsily made a mess of everything. But he didn't. He, he, he had everything at the beginning. He made a clumsy brute of himself through it, and threw it all away, but he was much more than that. Much more than just some clumsy brute. Verse 13, And when he had made an end of prophesying, he came to the high place. And Saul's uncle said unto him, and to his servant, Whither went ye? And he said, To seek the asses. And when we saw that they were nowhere, we came to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Tell me, I pray thee, what Samuel said unto you. And Saul said unto his uncle, He told us plainly that the asses were found, but of the matter of the kingdom, whereof Samuel spake, he told him not. And Samuel called the people together unto the Lord, to Mizpah, and said unto the children of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all the kingdoms, and of them that oppressed you, and ye have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulations, and you have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near, by their families, the family of Matri was taken, and Saul the son of Kish was taken, and when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if the man should yet find thither. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. And they ran and fetched him thence. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders upward. 
And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom, and wrote it in a book, and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him, and brought him no presents. But he held his peace. Now, there again, you can see there the Lord was giving them an object lesson. Whether it was a matter of knowing that it was going to fail, as a purely human king, despite everything he was given, that he was about to mess it up anyway, and therefore the reason a Benjamite, not someone of Judah, was chosen as the first king, whatever the reason, we know where it's going from there, but the lesson there is, is really a very stark warning to, to people, anybody, that having the Holy Spirit, having all the benefits, I mean, not very many people, very, very, very few people, were given the benefit that, that Saul was just given there. And he was looking at him. He, he was, even after all of that, it didn't swell his head. He was still a reluctant and humble man. He didn't seek the power. He didn't seek the authority. He didn't seek any of it. And again, that on top of it shows that he was going to use it properly. Because if you start swinging, throwing your weight around, strutting around like some little rooster, typical human nature, we see leaders like that all around the world, so-called leaders. But he didn't do it. But what happened to him? Again, you can see how people get sort of drawn into their carnality and lose it. And David, it happened with David as well, but the difference is that David repented. Saul, as we'll read, didn't. Not genuinely, not really. He was sorry when he messed up. He was sorry to see the result. But he wasn't sorry before God. And there, I think, is the only difference as a matter in the reason I read that. The only reason the comparison between them, Saul is often, as I said, portrayed as this brute. David, he was just the, the, the lovely child. But the thing is, as a matter of their character, the humility and, and all of that, they were very close as a matter of what they could have been. And the, the civil war that was fought between them, they were pretty evenly matched there as a matter of, of tactical commanders in the field. They were Neither one of them really could get a stranglehold on the other. But Saul, he started making mistakes. So it, it started going to his head. It started doing it. And as we'll read. But you, he, it wasn't because he didn't have it. That's my point. He, he had the advantages, every possible advantage. And he just didn't use them. Just didn't use it. When Samuel chapter 11, the Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead, and all the men of Jabesh said unto Nabash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition will I make a covenant with you, that I may thrust out all your right eyes, and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. And the elders of Jabesh said unto him, Give us seven days respite, that we may send messengers unto all the coasts of Israel, and then, if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. Then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul, and told the tidings in the ears of the people, and all the people lifted up their voices and wept. And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field, and said, What aileth the people, that they weep? And they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And stopped there. There was the king out in the, in the field with the cattle, he wasn't living in a palace. He wasn't. He hadn't fallen into the typical humanity yet. Again, verse six. And the spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings, and his anger was kindled greatly. And he took a yoke of oxen and hewed them to pieces and sent them throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. And when he numbered them, in Bezek the children of Israel were three hundred thousand, and the men of Judah thirty thousand. And they said unto the messengers that came thus, 
shall ye say unto the men of Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow, by that time the sun be hot, ye shall have help. And the messengers came and shewed it to the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. Therefore the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will come out unto you, and ye shall do with us all that seemeth good unto you. And so it was on the morrow that Saul put the people in three companies, and then came into the midst of the host in the morning watch, and slew the Ammonites until the heat of day. And it came to pass that they which remained were scattered, so that two of them were not left together. And the people said unto Samuel, Who is he that said, Saul shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men, that we may put them to death. And Saul said, There shall not be a man put to death this day, for today the Lord hath wrought salvation in Israel. Stop. He's still doing everything right. You know, we look at Saul as the, the real disaster that he was at the end, but he's right here doing everything right. Everything. Watch carefully where things start going bad as we read on. Verse 14, Then said Samuel to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. And all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal, and they sacrificed sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Again, on and on and on it went. There was Saul ready to lead. Really, at that point, Israel had themselves a really good king. Probably better than anybody, including David, later on, because David made his mistakes, primarily because Satan was throwing everything at him. But look at what this man is doing. He's just right, perfectly right every time. 1 Samuel chapter 12, And Samuel said unto all Israel, Behold, I have hearkened unto your voice, and all that ye said unto me, and have made a king over you. Now, and now, behold, the king walketh before you, and I am old and gray-headed, and behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. Behold, here I am, witness against me before the Lord, and before his anointed, whose ox have I taken, or whose ass have I taken, or whom have I defrauded, whom have I oppressed, or of those hand have I deceived any bribe, to blind mine eyes therewith, will I restore it to you. And they said, Thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. And he said unto them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day, that ye have not found aught in my hand. And they answered, He is witness. And Samuel said unto the people, It is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron, that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and to your fathers. When Jacob was come into Egypt, your fathers cried unto the Lord. Then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, which brought forth your fathers out of Egypt, and made them dwell in this place. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Caesarea, captain of the host of Hazor, into the hand of the Philistines, and, mine, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. And they cried unto the Lord, and said, We have sinned, because we have forsaken the Lord, and have served Balaam and Ashtaroth, but now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies, and we will serve thee. And the Lord set Jeroboam, and Bedan, and Jephthah, and Samuel, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you dwelled safe. It's not, that's all the judges. Verse 12, And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, you said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us, when the Lord your God was your king. Stop. See, there it was right there. They wanted a human king when they already had a king. The Lord Jesus Christ did not need David as is commonly believed, in order to claim the kingship over all of Israel, or king of the Jews, king of Israel. He didn't need David to do that. He didn't need that line to do that. Because he already was that, as a matter of himself, as the creator of Israel, out of Jacob. 
Israel wasn't Jacob's idea, it was the Lord's. Verse 13, Now therefore, behold, the king whom ye have chosen, and whom ye have desired, and behold, the Lord hath set a king over you. If ye will fear the Lord, and serve him, and obey his voice, and rebel not, and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that remaineth over you continue following the Lord your God. Stop. Is this a hint as to what the turning point for Saul's failure will be? Because you notice he was doing things really, really right here as long as he was looking up to Samuel. That is to say, as long as he was looking up to the law of the Lord. Samuel was the key. And as we'll get to, even after Samuel, the very famous incident of calling up the, the spirit of Samuel, very uh, debatable point there, how he looked to Samuel even after Samuel had died, there's the key. Verse 15, But if ye, if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you, as it was against your fathers. Now therefore stand and see this great thing, which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call upon the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain, that ye may perceive this, and see that your wickedness is great, which ye have done in the sight of the Lord, in asking you for a king. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not, for we have added unto all our sins this evil, to ask for a king. And Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. Stop there, and there's a prophecy of what's about to happen to Saul. Same thing. Verse 22, For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. But if he shall still do wickedly, he shall be consumed, both ye and your king. And that was a prophecy that was fulfilled exactly. And But you can see there, Saul had the character to look to the word of God. He greatly respected Samuel, as the entire nation did. That, that's held truth throughout his lifetime. They had no respect for his two sons, because they didn't deserve any. They were corrupt, young fools, wicked. Wicked, by the way, means twisted. That's, that's, I'll put the link on for that word, for that study. You, the word wick and wicked are from the same word. It means twisted. A, wicked, a wick in a candle was twisted. And ironically, it burns, and so are the wicked. It, the, the word even there goes together very well. But you can see what was keeping Saul on the right track up to that point. And it was Samuel. It was Samuel that had that, that influence over him. He looked to him. To him, and as we said, we will, as we'll get to in the next sermon, he is even after Samuel died, he, he, he encountered that witch at Endor, used that witch at Endor, which was another violation of the Lord. He was really going in into right off the deep end by that time. But you can see that that was keeping him going, not looking at Samuel, but looking at the law of the Lord, of which Samuel was in effect the high priest, although he wasn't. But he was a prophet and a judge. So you can see there what, why he was going to deviate. Because a lot of people misunderstood Saul. He, he had that character. He had the right. And ironically, by the time David comes along, David didn't. He, he knew Samuel as well. He looked to him in the same way. But Samuel died long before David became king in that way. So, and whereas Saul was king prior to that time. David didn't have a Samuel. 
whereas Saul did. And then, again, like more strength was really needed on the part of David of his own. There was the difference. And there is what, as we'll get to in the, in the next sermon, where Saul starts to lose it because he, he was like, he had his lessons. He was given everything he needed. But there he was all grown up and he still acted like a little boy when he had everything he needed to be the king. Thank you for joining us for services this week. As always, your being with us makes our joy complete. Until next week when we meet again on this God's Holy Sabbath day, may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you all.